Well, good morning, church. Uh, last week, we kicked off this series, a new teaching series called Battery Drain. And uh, we are, we're trying to consider some, some common beliefs that people hold about, about God and about, about life. And, and we're looking at those beliefs a little bit like the, the apps that we, we download to some of our devices. That, that sometimes, you know, we, we will have some um, that we use on a, on a very regular basis, but sometimes we, you know, we have to download an app so that we can sign our kid up to go on a field trip, and then we forget about it, that we ever put it on there, and it stays. But that is still now a part of our system, and, and, and actually some of these programs we've found can, can actually hurt your battery life over time, or they can cause issues with the, with, with the functionality of your, of your device. And... And we're looking at, at beliefs sort of in a similar way, that, that the things that we, we believe about, about life, about God, how he relates to us, that, that sometimes we will, we will pick up new beliefs, um, especially this seems to happen whenever we're in the middle of some rough times, whenever we've got hard decisions to make, and, and we will hear something about, about God that, that sounds pretty good, and it kind of helps us get through that moment, and and then we don't really think about it anymore. We sort of store it away, but it's still back there, and it's still, it's still filtering in our lives what we, what we sort of expect to experience, what we expect the world to be like, what we expect our experience with God to be like. But the problem is, if, if some of these common beliefs, if they, don't, if they don't actually line up with what God says is true, eventually they're going to let us down. They're, they're not going to hold up, and they're going to end up draining the life from us, and they're going to end up leading us to miss out on really some of, the, some of the better truths that God has for us. So in the course of this series, what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to look at those, those better truths. We're trying to, to see that they have something, something better to offer us than some of these common life-draining, battery-draining beliefs, and, and we're seeing if maybe together we can we can delete <laughs> some of those battery drains in our life and, and replace them with something better. So today we're, we're looking at, at this common belief. Do good, and good will happen to you. Now this is a, this is a pick-me-up kind of belief. You know, it's, it, it's something that whenever, whenever life isn't going great, or whenever things seem like they're not fair, Something like this just encourages us. It encourages us to, I don't know, to, to keep going, to keep trying to do right, to keep trying to be a good person. And, and you know, eventually things will, they'll start to, to break your way. And I don't think that we believe this simplistically by any stretch. I don't think that we believe that, you know, oh yeah, if I, if I hold the door open for someone, then, then, you know, a few minutes later, I'm going to find a dollar on the floor to reward me for my good deed. No, we t this is something we tend to think of a little more generally. You know, as we, as we go through the ups and downs of life, we feel like, you know what, in, in the grand scheme, if I keep trying to do good things, then, then stuff in life is, is sort of going to overall, you know, start to fall my way. And we, we all sort of imply with that that, you know, the, the more good that I do, well, the, maybe the better things will kind of pan out for me. Because we've got these, we've got these like varying degrees of, of, of good doing that we all kind of think about. Like there's the, there's the minimum threshold for doing good, which is just not doing bad. Like that's, that's your, you know, I don't hurt other people. I, I don't commit any crimes. You know, it's, I don't know, we feel like we get a few points for that, right? And then there's, then there's a sort of your step up. I would, I would call this the, uh, the, the, the doing good of, of maybe some mild inconveniences. That's like, like letting someone merge in front of you in traffic who clearly waited way too long to get over. Or uh, returning a shopping cart in the parking lot that wasn't yours. Or, or you know, going ahead and, and tacking on that dollar donation to the good cause that the, the store is, is supporting with your purchase. You know, at this, at this point, we're like, okay, now I'm moving out of the realm of just, you know, just not bad, and, I, and I'm starting to enter into maybe what could be considered good person territory. 
Then, you know, then we've got some of the, some of the, like, the big ticket things, you know, vo volunteering at a food kitchen, giving my, my spare time to, to, to build low-income housing or affordable housing, um, you know, scheduling, like, regular charitable donations, you know, the big stuff. And, and, you know, since we are, since we are in, in a church service, I don't, I don't think it'll come as too much of a shock to, to most of the people listening that, that as followers of Jesus, we actually, we actually see even an, a, an ultimate good uh, in sharing with people the message of Jesus. Like we, we believe that, that in Jesus we, we have, have a message of, of hope, a message of love, I mean, even, even life after death. So, so for, for us as, as Christians, the, like the greatest good that we could possibly do for someone is, is to live out and to share the message of Jesus with them. Now, this, this is kind of a side note, but it's, it's an important side note, especially whenever we're going to spend most of our time this morning talking about like doing good deeds. And, and that side note is that as followers of Jesus— we don't do good deeds to try and earn God's love. God, God already loves us. God, God loves us, and we don't, we don't do these, these good deeds to try and, and bring us into relationship with God. Jesus brought us into relationship with God when he died on the cross for all of our bad deeds. And so what, what our good deeds are, and, and this will apply as we talk about this all throughout this morning and any other time it comes up, what our good deeds are is, is a joyful response to what Jesus has done for us. It's like, I, I think of the times that I have given my, my children just a, a really exciting gift, and, and they've, you know, they've jumped up and down, and they've, 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 they've been so excited, and they run, and they like give, give hugs to, to my wife and I, and and wouldn't it be funny if, if we looked at that response as though it were the payment? If you didn't jump up and give me the hug and, and jump up and down, then, then, then somehow the gift wouldn't be given. Like, that's, that's nonsense. <laughs> when we try to do good things as followers of Jesus, it is in joyful response to what Jesus has already done for us, not in any way trying to earn it. But when we start doing these good things, you know, we, it, it doesn't stop us from starting to sort of think that maybe we should be receiving some, some good rewards in this life for doing those things. And, and this is something that, a mindset, a, a philosophy that non-Christians and Christians alike, whether, whether they really think real actively about it or not, they go through life thinking that, well, we expect that if we do good, that some good will come back to us. And the flip side, like if, if someone is, is a jerk or worse, well, eventually that's, that's going to come back to, to them too. It's an idea that, that uh, has roots in a lot of different places. Uh, some of it roots in religions like Hinduism and, and Buddhism, religions that believe in karma. And those religions, they, they believe in reincarnation, that the life you're living isn't the only one that you'll live, and, and that your, your next life is, is very much going to be based on what you did in this life. So if you tried to do good things, tried to be a, be a good person in, in this life, then your status in your next life will be, will be a better one. And if you did bad things, did selfish things, focused on, on just you in, in this life, then, then your, your next life is going to be is going to be more negative than the one you have now. That's, that's a, a, a highly oversimplification of the idea of karma, but, but you get it. Now, now as, as followers of Jesus, we don't believe in reincarnation. We believe that there's, there's one time around, we get one go at, at this life. Um, but, but there is some, some grounding for this idea of, of do good and, and good will come your way. There's some grounding of that in even the wisdom that the, the Bible offers, like most of, the, most of the beliefs that we're talking about in this series. Biblical wisdom points to trends in life, and one of those trends is that generally we will get back what we put in. We will reap 
what we sow, so to speak. Meaning that in those, in those trends, generally, there's a general connection between hard work and, and wise choices and, and positive results. And there's a, there's a general connection between uh, foolishness, wicked living, and, and negative consequences. We, we believe that that's a reality. We believe that to be true. There, there's also, um, I, I think this belief also, it comes, it comes from this innate desire in us for justice that was, that was really put in us by our creator who loves justice. I was, I was driving to work. This was probably like three or four years ago. I was driving to work in the morning. It was uh, coming up to a, a very busy intersection, probably the busiest intersection on my commute. And you know, it was commuting time, and it was, it was morning, and, and it, was, it was dark outside, and moods, I mean, probably weren't just the best, because you know, it's, it's morning, and, and you're having to go to work, and the coffee hasn't kicked in yet. And I remember coming up to this intersection, the light turned yellow, and we all start to slow down, and this car, maybe, maybe two or three behind me, whips out of our lane, out of our lane, through the left-hand turn lane for the people who were turning through the intersection and into the lane of oncoming traffic and zooms around the left-hand turners and us and flies straight through the intersection as, as the light turns red. It was one of those moments where it's just like, did that really just happen? Like, did, like, like, I can't believe that someone would be so impatient, would, would be valuing their own, their own time, getting to where they're trying to get so much more than the safety of all of the rest of us. Like, like where is, where is a, a cop whenever something like that happens? And it just so happened <laughs> that there was a police officer who was sitting at the front of the intersection waiting to go the other direction. And the guy flies through, and sure enough, the, the lights get hit, they, they get turned on, and, and everybody else waiting at the intersection jumps out of their cars and starts cheering. Um, okay, that last part didn't happen, but the rest of it all did. But, like, I remember being, like, happier than I should have been in this situation, because it felt like, yes, there is, there is justice in the universe. I think that, that God puts that in us. Like, God loves justice. He cares about things being fair. And so it's not a surprise that the, the, the people that he created would care about that too. When someone does something bad, we, we want something bad to happen. When someone does something good, we, we hope that something good is going to happen. Okay, now, whenever we do something bad, we're not so excited about the justice. That's, that's whenever we jump up and down because of the gift of the grace of Jesus, right? But in general, the, a, a belief that when you do good, eventually good is going gonna, is gonna to come back to you in life. It just, it just seems right to us, doesn't it? So why list this as a battery-draining belief? Why, why would I suggest that even with some of the, some of the backing that it has, that, that living your life by this, trying to, trying to understand the world by it, trying to make sense of what God is up to by it, why would I say that maybe that can do more harm than good? Well, in a word, weariness. We will grow weary. We will get worn out. If we are working for these outcomes, working for this to be true in a world where we're just never going to consistently experience it. A lot of it comes down to the, the, the good that we're, that we're sort of looking to see come back to us as reward. I mean, when we think about that, do good and good things will happen to you, we we know the kind of good things that we're thinking of there. You know? And this, is, this doesn't just go for people who don't follow Jesus. This would be Christians as well. We're, we're hoping for things like health for ourselves and for the people we care about. We're hoping for, for positive, important relationships in our lives. For, for some people, that just means uh, friendships that will last a lifetime. For other people, that's the, the hope of, of getting married and having kids and having grandkids and having those relationships would be very good. 
Some people are hoping for uh, profitability in their work and, and long-term financial security. I think all of us are hoping to maybe have a, a little more just, just fun and, and, and rest in our lives. And, and hear me, church, none of those are bad things. Like all of those are things that I, I think that we would count as, as blessings if we had them. But we're not promised any of them certainly not as a reward for doing good things in this life. And how does it start to impact us? How deflating is it if we believe that, if we even expect that doing good things is going to reward people with, with some of, of that, and then the most caring person that we know gets cancer? Or... The, the hardest working dad we know gets laid off. The, the, most, the most faithful and loving wife and mother, her husband walks out on her and the kids. We grow weary. The, the chaos in this life, it, it runs in the face of the belief that if you do good, good things are just going to come back to you. It might... That belief might protect us for a little while when one bad thing happens, another bad thing happens, and we can just say, you know what, it's all gonna, it's all gonna pan out, it's all gonna even up, the universe is gonna, is gonna square this thing out eventually, but eventually, when we see it happen again, and again, and again, it's gonna be too much. We're gonna get tired, we're gonna feel too beat up by it, it's gonna seem too random, it's gonna seem too unfair, we're going to get tired. We're going to grow weary of trusting God to reward good people with good results. And eventually maybe we decide, you know what, it's actually just not worth it. It's, it's not worth it. Maybe God's not worth it. And we stop trying to do what is good. And we say, you know what, I think I'm just going to look out for myself. Can I confess to you that this is, uh, this is a belief that's actually fairly easy pitfall for pastors to fall into? I mean, I, I already told you that, that as followers of Jesus, we believe that the greatest good we could do for someone is to share with them the message of Jesus. Well, as pastors, you get to thinking in your head, you know what, I, I, I spend my whole life trying to do good things for God, so, so why wouldn't God reward me with you know, perfect kids <laughs> and health and, and a thriving church that I can go talk up to all my other pastor friends. And it's never quite that easy. And some people get discouraged. Some people even walk away from the ministry saying things like, I spent so much time doing good for God, and this is what he gives me in return. That's not a that's not a pastor specific sentiment, is it? Friends, there is a there's a better truth than this one that will that will drain the life out of you and will leave you a guarded and, and self focused person. It's a truth that's it's more satisfying than than any of the any of the comfort or security that your life could possibly be rewarded with it's more satisfying than that but we can't see it as long as our expectation is that we're going to be rewarded for doing good in in these ways the better truth is found in something that's much less visible and something that's far more valuable if you got a bible i'd love for you to turn with me to second corinthians and look at chapter four 2 Corinthians is a letter written by Paul. Um, he was a man who, who, I think most of us would say, who know any of Paul's story, that he worked harder for Jesus than maybe anybody else in history. And he was a man who very much did not experience the, the good that, that a lot of us would maybe think of as a reward um, for some, of the, for some of the measures that we use. What, what Paul received for his good was that he was, he was threatened, he was slandered, he was beaten, he was betrayed, he was imprisoned, 
He was shipwrecked. All in the course of what many of us would consider to be doing the greatest good. And, and Paul, in this chapter of 2 Corinthians 4, he helps us to open our eyes to the, the better truth that God has for us. Let's start off with verse 1. He says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, because we were shown mercy, we do not give up. Again, followers of Jesus, we, we need to always remember that any good we do, it is in response to an incredible reward that we have already received. Not trying to earn one that we haven't gotten yet. It is, we have received that incredible reward in the mercy of Jesus Christ on the cross. Any other reward that we might get for our doing good, and, and trust me, he's actually going to tell us that there are some. Anything else that we may get, it's, it's cherry on top. For, for Paul, the mercy of Jesus was all the motivation that he needed to keep doing his ministry. And we're going to jump down in, in chapter 4 to verse 8. And Paul writes, We are afflicted in every way but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry the death of Jesus in our body so that the life of Jesus may also be displayed in our body. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that Jesus' life may also be displayed in our mortal flesh. So then, death is at work in us, but life in you. Paul is saying he has suffered. He expected to suffer. He didn't expect his good deeds to result for him in comfort and security. If anything, he expected that his ministry was going to bring him more hardship. As a matter of fact, God tells us. He, he, he says that following Jesus, it's not, it's not a promise of an easier life. It's actually something that is going to bring you the exact opposite. I know someone out here has invited a guest today, and you're thinking... Pastor, could we get to the better truth that you're talking about? <laughs> like you were building it up. Let's get to that part. And it actually starts right here. When Paul says that, that we suffer, that death is at work in our bodies, what he's saying is that when we suffer, when we continue to, to face whatever it is life may throw at us, and we continue to show Jesus, other people get to hear about Jesus. Death may be at work in us, but life is at work in you. And then if we jump to verse 15, it says, Indeed, everything is for your benefit, so that as grace extends through more and more people, it may cause thanksgiving to increase to the glory of God. Paul was willing to endure Whatever, <laughs> because the reward for his ministry, the reward for the good things he was doing for Jesus was that more and more people might come to faith and that they might all celebrate and give praise to God for what was happening in the lives of others. Yeah, it can be, it can be very tiring to continue trying to do good in the name of Jesus whenever we're not seeing the return in our lives in the form of a job promotion, in the form of a clean bill of health. But other people will have a walk with Jesus. Other people will have life for eternity because of God's efforts through us in enduring hardship. You know, there, there are some sports where they will, they will award some of the individual awards, the, the valuable player awards, actually before the championship game for that sport is played. 
And one of the things that I love is whenever, whenever an athlete wins that and, and will say something to the effect of, well, I'm very honored to receive this award, but that's not really my goal. Like, it doesn't really mean a whole lot that I've received this unless my team wins the championship. They're, they're saying that, that I care more about, about a, a, a team win, about, about the, these people that I care about also receiving this, this incredible reward than I just care about getting this one on my own. I mean, could you imagine the heat that would come down on, on someone? It's like if they win the, the most valuable player and, and they were like, you know what? I feel like I've accomplished all of my personal goals. I'm just going to sit the championship game out. Jesus gave us the gift of eternal life. Our purpose is not to just grab that reward and, and walk into heaven on our own. The much greater reward for us than, than trying to start our heaven early by getting, getting some security, getting some, some relative ease, is to get to be a part of other people going there too. Because there's going to be plenty of time for that other stuff when we get there together. Now, not to sound too much like the game show business, but wait, there's more. Verse 16, therefore, we do not give up. Even though our outer person is being destroyed, our inner person is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is producing for us an absolutely incomparable eternal weight of glory. So, we do not focus on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. What this means is that we aren't just rewarded with having an eternal impact for others. It means that we are also banking an eternal reward to which Paul can give us no comparison. Can't even tell us what it's about. This is actually kind of infuriating for me as a preacher. Because I just want to be able to tell you. I just want to be able to say, this is what we're going to be looking forward to. This is what it's going to be like. And this is why it's going to make anything that we may have to endure here worth it. But I can't. There's no comparison to give. C.S. Lewis, he wrote this, this, this great little bit where he, he, said, he said that we are half-hearted creatures. We're fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. And we, you, you picture the, the kid from the poorest part of town, maybe has never been more than, than a few miles from home, and, and someone approaches this child and offers them a luxury vacation. They say, no, nah, I'm fine. I'm, I'm going to stay here playing in the dirt. Because, he, because they don't even have a category for what a luxury vacation is. That's us. We, we are happy playing around with these, these good things that, that life might give us. We want those to be our reward because we literally don't have a category for what God has waiting for us. And Paul, he makes this statement, and it's frustrating at first because he calls the affliction that we face here, he says, it's light and momentary. It doesn't feel like that, does it? It's like whenever you're telling someone, I've had a, I've had a really bad week, and you want to tell them about it, and they say, oh, well, let, let's just let you hear the week that I've had, and just like completely run over, you know, your hurt and, and your hardship. And that's, that's not what Paul is doing here. He's not saying, you know, yeah, your, your affliction is light and momentary compared to mine. What he's trying to do by saying that is help us wrap our minds around what is waiting for us in eternity. I mean, if anything, it, it might even be good for us to stop and try and feel the weight of it. I mean, think about the hardship. Think about how long your 
affliction has lasted. Think about how heavy a weight that's felt. Think about how you seem to have tried to do good things, tried to do the right things, and not seen the kind of return for them that you would hope for. What Paul tells us, the better truth, it's that someday your blessing will so far outweigh the difficulty that you have gone through in this life, both in the duration of it and in the intensity of it, that as bad as what you've experienced may feel, as long as you feel you've had to experience it, it's going to seem like the equivalent of a shoulder shrug compared to what you've gained. But there is no comparison. So, in Galatians 6, 9, Paul writes, let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. If we believe that that doing good, even doing good for Jesus, if we believe that's going to reward us with a comfortable or an easy life, it's going to drain us. We're going to get tired. We are going to grow weary whenever it doesn't seem to play out that way. We're going to grow disillusioned with doing good, may even grow disillusioned with God. The life-giving truth is that when we do good, Good things will happen, just not the things that the world would have us expect. Things that can't be seen, things that can't be measured on this side of eternity, but things that are going to last far longer and satisfy far better than we can possibly fathom. Church, we're going to move into a time of communion now, a time where we recognize the Lord's Supper. Life is hard. And as we navigate the ups and the downs of it, trying to make sense of it, if there is anything that should make sense to any of us, it's that our world is broken. Is that it, all things aren't as they should be, that it doesn't operate in a way that is fair or just or loving. Jesus had to give his life to save a broken people like us. And when we come to this time and we get to say thank you, we get to take a piece of bread that reminds us of his body that was nailed to a cross. We drink from a cup that reminds us of his, his blood that was poured out for us. We come to this moment to say thank you, to, to remind us that, that we, we ha- have been given everything that we need. We have been given this incredible mercy and grace because of Jesus. Let that be an encouragement to us to, to, to continue coming to him and continue trying to live our lives for him, knowing that we may have to endure suffering like he suffered for us. We may have to suffer here, but that, but that he is working in and through that so that more people can know about him and there is something waiting for us, a greater eternal reward, and I can't explain it to you, but I know it's gonna be worth it. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks, Lord. We give you thanks for the, the truth that is found in your word. And Lord, we would, we would so much love to, love to see our, our rewards, Lord, start coming in this, in this quick and, and tangible way in this life. Lord God, it can be so damaging to us when we believe that or when we even expect that our doing good is going to result in just a, an easy, comfortable life. And 
So God, I pray that you would, you would remove that belief from our minds, that you would, you would delete it from our systems, Lord, and replace it with the truth that God, when, when we live for you and we try to do good for you, Lord, you are doing good. Good things will happen, just not the good things the world's looking for. And Lord, that with that knowledge, we would trust we would trust more and more, Lord, that no matter what we're going through, knowing we can endure it because we know that you are working it out for an incredible good in the end. We thank you for that cross, Jesus. We couldn't even begin to have a conversation about trying to do good if it wasn't for what you did for us on that cross, Jesus. That your act of, of sacrifice has saved us and it makes anything good that we do something that, that can actually have an impact because of what you did on that cross. And so we thank you now and we pray that as we take this time to remember that you would give us the strength that we need to keep going. We love you, Jesus. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen.